32 gear? Nope. Nope. I hope it runs long enough. Oh well. Well, I did a review last time, and the point of the review was the logos to tell us to the overall mark. So I don't want to go back over a big review, but you know, the thing I just want to remind you about is, and this is true of all four Gospels, so this is a problem that we have in modern scholarship, that we want to look at the Gospels like they're English literature, and you can't. You've got to look at them as Greek literature, and Mark especially. So, you know, I think we've seen how the nuances of Mark, and we'll continue to see how the nuances of Mark. I think Mark is an astounding Greek document. It's a wonderful Greek document. It's simpler than the other Gospels, but it's still a very complex and a very Greek document. So we looked at it and we saw that we are marching forward to the most important chapter, which is the eighth chapter. We're on chapter seven, and all of that is a setup because the setup is the transition chapter. Transition chapter is eight, and you probably know it, well, maybe you don't know what the transition is in Mark. Anybody want to guess what the transition is in Mark? Or do you remember from the review we had? The huge transition is the question that Jesus asked that's a Socratic question. And not only does he display in that Socratic question what his, his focus is, but he sets the tone of the whole document. You know, you might be reading the document. I don't know how you could. Like, let's say you're a Greek or a, a Hebrew person that reads Greek. Reading this document, well, remember, you don't read documents, right? It's being recited to you or you're memorizing it with someone, right? That's what's happening. So you're not really reading it, but you're, it, it's re being recited to you, or you have already memorized the whole document. So you, if you're going back over this document, you've already memorized it, so it's too late. So you're listening to it, right? That may be the best thing. You're listening to it, and at first you think, well, this is a great Greek document, and I can see how the Logos to tell us is going. But you might think, well, there's some real... Uh, judistic elements or Hebraic elements in this, which I, I find hard to believe, but that's okay, you might think that. But the minute you get to eight, and Jesus asks a question, who do people say that I am? That is a Socratic question, that is not a rabbinic question. And the minute he says that, there's no way you could, you, you could dispute that this is purely a Greek document, and the whole focus of Jesus is to make this a Greek statement. And so therefore, as we look at this, it's Logos to tell us. So we are setting up the Logos to tell us this logical argument that we're focusing on is the question of, number one, who is this Jesus guy? And guess what? In the middle of the document, which is beautiful Greek, right? We get the question. Do we ever get an answer? Not really. You know, I, I'm giving you a foreshadowing. Peter, you know, says, you are the uh, Christ. The Son of the Living God, right? That's a foreshadowing. But does Jesus ever answer the question? This is what perplexed. You know, when you were a young kid, right? When you were a kid in, in, in school and you read the New Testament and you're being taught, what perplexed you? Yeah, didn't you always say, well, you know, for example, your professor or professorette says in college, well, Jesus never claimed to be God, did he? If you go back and read in English, does Jesus ever say, literally, right out, I am God? No. no. And when you're a kid, doesn't that bother you? You know, when you're a kid and you're studying it, and you're in... I remember back when I was in sixth grade, I was studying this stuff, and, you know, nowhere did Jesus... And I was reading the Bible, and nowhere does Jesus say, I'm God. And your teachers were generally unable to answer the question about Jesus and God, right? And so you get books by Dan Brown. That the church made up that Jesus thought he was God. But if you read it in the Greek sense, what is always evident? In Greek, you never answer the telos, right? You never tell me what the telos is. It's always a logos. Because why? It's supposed to be self-evident. And the things we've seen have been self-evident. Matt, we're going to see some self-evident stuff today. Because like I said, I want to go back and... Oh, I guess I should do the words today. But I don't want to go back in time too much. But I want to look specifically in chapter 7 as we get a setup for chapter 8 to see where we're going. So let's look at the words of the day. 
Um, we've had kind of these words before, but I just want to focus on them. E N T A L M A T A. In tau mata. And in tau mata. Now figure out the auto part because remember I told you I'm not teaching you Greek, I'm just teaching you the Greek main forms of the Greek. So tau mata, taumos, this is this is telos. And if you look, I gave you the the uh, parts of the word here, intalma, intalmata, intalma. Intalmata is the plural, by the way, just so you know. But specifically, um, comes from telos, and this is a set telos. The way you could say this is, this is, th the best way to say this is a set telos. In other words, it's a telos, it is a singular telos. So remember, a telos, this is why I like this Greek stuff, it's so cool. A telos, remember, it's a projection on the horizon, is a projection and it goes, it's not just a projection on the horizon, it's an intellectual concept. That you see the Legos, the Logos, and then you're looking, the Logos is projected to the horizon. And so theoretically, there are innumerable numbers of teloses you could have for a Logos, right? But if you notice, you know, a single projection on the horizon when you draw a picture. But an in telos, a set telos, in talma, a set telos is a specific telos. And so, for example, its translation is a commandment. And if you look at what, strong, I'd always tell you, be cautious of Strong's and Vines. Strong's and Vines at the end there is pretty cool. They say, you know, specifically, say a conclusion of an act or state, specifically an impost or levy, as to enjoin an injunction, a religious precept and translate commandment, but literally means a set conclusion, a conclusion. This word in Talma is probably the closest to conclusion. In other words, it is a stated telos, a stated telos. Very, very interesting and clear in the Greek. This is P-A-R-A-D-O-S, paradosin. This is also uh, plural, para, para. Dos, dos, paradosis. Paradosis, para means near. That's our favorite one, right? Near, near. Paradomai, para, para, near, and domai, to cause, to give. So specifically, this means near give. Near give. In other words, to transmit. Transmit. And translated in the uh, Translated, here it says uh, an ordinance or tradition, but it's what is transmitted from the elders. In other words, it's, notice um, this could be a commandment, it's a conclusion, a stated telos. This is what is transmitted. This is based in a logos of some kind, right? This isn't necessarily. This could be like what we would call an old wives' tale, right? An old wives' tale, you stand in the rain, you get cold, you get sick, that nah, can't happen. Not possible. Okay? But it's transmitted. So it's not based on logic or any reasoning at all, right? But it's transmitted. So what is transmitted? What is tradition? Um, this is one of my favorite words, D-O-R-O-N, Doron. It's really interesting that this crops up, but it does crop up in this. This means a... Sacrificial gift, yes, sacrificial gift. And this is what um, Paul calls Jesus a Doron. So this is very different than a gift, it's a sacrificial gift. You remember all those words for love and like that the Greeks have? They got equal numbers of words for, for gifts and things like that, for giving and things. So everyone is specific. And it's really funny, I, I mean, okay, this is like gag time, right? So when we read in our New Testament, and it says, a gift. Well, what kind of gift? Guess what it says? Doron, or a specific type of gift in Greek. So that's the kind of thing that we want to know, right? That we want to pick out of it. And this one is a word, korban, korban. This is a word that's from the Aramaic. 
And it means, it, it specifically is in Aramaic, it comes from the Aramaic words, uh, it literally means a votive offering, a consecrated present or gift to the temple fund. Um, literally uh, to the treasury itself or the room of the contribution boxes. Now, what is very interesting about this is I, I want you to remember back to Malachi. What was the curse of Malachi? Does anybody remember what God found wrong with Malachi and the priests during the Malachi's period? They, they were given, uh, they had injured, injured animals or, or not perfect animals that they were sacrificing. That's what we like to read in the English, but if you remember back to the class we had, the um, big deal... They weren't, eating, they weren't eating the tithe. That's right, they weren't eating the tithe. Because what's supposed to happen is when you bring your gifts, right, your Doran, because Korban and Doran, this is the Aramaic, this is the Greek. In the Greek, a Doran is a gift freely given in sacrifice to the temple, to the gods. <coughs> what's a Korban? What's a Korban? I don't know. Uh, it's is this in the Bible? What were you supposed to bring to the temple? Was that the was the korban a required tenth, as opposed to a freely given sacrificial gift? Well, let let's take a second and remember, you have five sacrifices: one, two, three, four, five sacrifices. You have the sacrifice of ascension, the ascension sacrifice. That's a sacrifice that we believe, you, you didn't individually give this. This was given at the beginning of the day, and the priest gave the ascension sacrifice to basically open the temple. The temple opened with the ascension sacrifice. By the way, what do we do the first thing in our services? We have an ascension prayer. Okay, the second one was the guilt. Acts of the sin and the guilt. And they're separated. If you committed a sin unintentionally unintentionally you could go and confess well you didn't have to confess you just brought your gift your offering and you offered it as a sin offering if you sin unintentionally if you weren't sure if you sin unintentionally but you wanted to make sure you would bring a guilt sacrifice so almost everybody brought a guilt sacrifice so you'd have one or the other so you have the ascension sacrifice and you would bring your guilt sacrifice just to make sure now, what happened if you did it intentionally? No, no, no sacrifice would fix that. No sacrifice for intentional sin. That's the, the problem. Once a year, right? The, the whole scapegoat once a year thing. The scapegoat was not for the sins that were, they were only for the sins that were unintentionally done by the people that they couldn't remember as a people. I taught that class before. I should probably go back and teach it again. It, you know, see, the problem is, what, what have we done? We want things to fit into a certain shape, right? And they don't. Even the, even the rabbis today, if you ask the rabbis, was there any, um, any sacrifice for intentional sin? The answer is no. It's strike clear, and I think it's in Leviticus or Deuteronomy, where it says there is no sacrifice for intentional sin, period. You have to be cut off from the people. So this is a serious problem. This is a problem that Jesus came to solve. And that's what Paul's... Paul's, remember Paul had two, in Romans, or in uh, Acts, we get two of Paul's sermons. One of his sermons is always to the Hebrews, and the other sermon is to the non-Greeks, or the non-Jews, right? And his sermon to the Jews is always. Remember, there are the 36, he doesn't list the 36, but there are 36 items which will get you to hell no matter what. There's no sacrifice for them, there's no forgiveness in Judaism for those 36 things. This is modern Judaism. But Paul always talked about that. And so therefore, his answer was, Jesus is a solution. And that was why it was such a hopeful thing for them. And of course, those in the diaspora couldn't do three of the things. What's three of the things if you missed your toast? The men going to the, the um, pilgrim festivals. There are six festivals in Judaism. And men, the man, the guy, had to go to three of them every year. And if he didn't, 
There's no, there's no sacrifice for it. There's no hope for it. In any case. Um, so what I was getting at. Okay, the, the next one is the priest's sacrifice. The fourth is the priest. That's our offering, by the way. The priest gives a homily and then we pay him because he does a good job. <laughs> the priest's sacrifice is of grain with, with oil on the top of it. And the priest gets the grain. The priest doesn't get a lot of this. He gets certain parts, but most of this is a, is a Holocaust sacrifice. So it's all burned up. Uh, only small pieces are left of this. And then finally, there is the Thanksgiving sa sacrifice. Where's the tithe? Mm -hmm. The fifth is the Thanksgiving sacrifice. And in the Messianic era, the era there's only one sacrifice that's required. It's Thanksgiving, which is, by the way, we call it Eucharist, the Lord's Supper, Eucharist. We do all this in our services, in this order. We follow the, we follow the ancient temple ritual, by the way. Except, there's something very interesting. Where's the tithe? What's the tithe? The tithe is not in this at all. The tithe... It's not a gift. It's a requirement. Well, what, okay, here's the tithe. What do I do with the tithe according to the Old Testament? I have the tithe. The tithe is 10%, and I take the 10%. That's the admission. I take the 10%, and I share it with God. I take the 10%, and the requirement, read very carefully in the Old Testament. I taught this. This is really obvious in the English as well as in the Hebrew. You take it to the temple and you eat it. Every bit of it is eaten. It is a festival that is accomplished in the name of God because you are participating in a festival meal with the deity. And by the way, the whole point of this is you can, according to the Bible, if you live too far away from the temple to bring it, you can convert it into money. And then you go to the temple, and there are money changers at the temple who change it into money that you can use to buy goods. Not sacrifices, but goods to eat. Because the whole point of this is you take 10% with you to the temple, and you eat it before God, with God. And the sin of Malachi was that they were bringing this, this temple sacrifice and guess what the temple is doing with it? Korban. They were keeping it in the storerooms. Because that's not why it was. Remember when Moses did the special levy in the wilderness so they could build the tabernacle? That wasn't a tithe. It wasn't a sacrifice. The people gave a special levy. Remember Jehoshaphat set up a special levy? He, he was the one, Jehoshaphat was the one who set up the uh, offering boxes in the temple. Those are not for a tithe. Those are not for the sacrifice. They are a special levy that Jehoshaphat set up so the priests would stop stealing the money. Remember Jehoshaphat? The priests were stealing the money from the strong boxes in the temple. And so the priest or the king set up a special system so they couldn't steal it. He probably put locks on it. Anyway. There's a lot in this, you know, stuff that, of course, you know, we don't, we don't get the whole of it when we're in Sunday school, right, for some reason. Why don't they tell us the, the unexpurgated version? I don't know. But anyway, let's delve into this, because what Jesus tells us, uh, I'm going to mention this really quickly. Um, do you remember, I don't know if you remember this, but I do very clearly. Have you ever had a pastor that ever told you what Corban means? Usually, in my experience, when you get to this word in either a sermon or teaching, the pastor or teacher will immediately tell you, oh, we don't know what this word means. We're not sure what this word means. Uh, rest assured, we know exactly what this word means. The rabbis write about it. It's right out of the Talmudic documents. Anyone who says, I don't know what this means, has either not studied it or has no clue what they're talking about. Uh, part of the problem is a lot of Christianity doesn't like to look at the Talmudic documents. I don't know why that's true. I use them as a lot of my study. Talmud, you know, the mission of Talmud. 
The Talmud is what defines the Mishnah, the unwritten Torah, and the Torah. And so if you don't understand the Talmud, you're not going to understand what a Korban means. But we'll see. Jesus talks about it. Well, let's look at chapter 7. I want to start at 5. I'm going just slightly back a little bit. Um, this is where Jesus, let's see, he came over the, um, I don't remember exactly where, he came over, I should have a picture here, I don't have a picture of a map, let's see, they came across, let's see, where were they exactly, they came across from the, come from Jerusalem, they come from Jerusalem, they came from Gennesaret, uh, Gennesaret and they anchored there. Yeah, they crossed over. So they are, I believe that they are, here's, here's the Sea of Galilee. They came over from Gennesaret. Remember, they were in the, the Cameron. And they came over, and I believe they're right about here. So they're pretty close to Capernaum and uh, Tiberias and that area. But they're in that area, and by the way, uh, if you remember, that there were Pharisees who came from Jerusalem. And I made a big deal because, you know, Jesus was gaining Pharisees and others and Sadducees and Grammateus were coming to ask him questions. Well, now we get Pharisees from Jerusalem, and that's what's important here. And so these Pharisees and the teachers of the law, by the way, are not the Grammateus, which is that other thing we've talked about before. I'm not going to go into great detail, but in five. So the Pharisees and the, and the Grammateus asked Jesus, why don't your disciples live, literally peripato, tread around according to the paradosis, the transmission of the elders, instead of eating their food with unclean hands? Remember, the question I asked you is, hey, what food are they eating? Are they eating the leftovers? Remember that he just fed the 5,000 or 4,000, and I said, are these the leftovers? You know, so they're eating the leftovers while they're, you know, they're having a snack while they're in the boat. And they come over and they did it. And so they're eating. And by the way, the word is koineos, hands. And I love this because, remember, we call this koinean Greek. Koinean. Koinos, koinios, koinean Greek is common Greek. This is the universal Greek of the time. So with common hands, with literally, uh, unclean is not a good word, um, it's translated unclean, but it doesn't necessarily mean they're not clean. It's common hands. <clears throat> yeah, you, you know, see, what we want, when we hear unclean, we immediately want to go to the cleanliness rules. Do you notice why they use the word common instead of unclean? What do you think? What do you think? Because it wasn't by law, it's just by their tradition. It's, yeah, the law doesn't say you have to wash your hands before you eat, right? The only time you have to wash your hands before you eat is what? Turuma, to eat the sacrificial meat in the temple, right? There's no law that says you have to wash your hands. So the Pharisees are very cautious here. They don't say you have unclean hands. They say you have common, clean hands, right? Right? Because if they say anything else, they're doing what? They're not following the law of the Torah. But you notice they use the word ter, ter, teradosin. So it's the, not the law, it's not the entoma of the law, it's the teradosin, the tradition of the elders, whoever those guys are, right? And the elders we know are the Sanhedrin. So, this is a very interesting thing. Um, I would also note, okay. So did the Sanhedrin have their own ritual to wash their hands before they ate? The Pharisees did. Not the Sanhedrin per se. Not Sanhedrin, but the Pharisees did. Well, but you said that, why don't you follow the elders, and then you said the elders were the Sanhedrin. Oh, yeah, yeah, Sanhedrin. Yes, you're correct. Um, the problem with the Sanhedrin is this. Um, the, okay, this, you know, there is such political stuff going on that it's really funny here, okay? How many, remember, how many, uh, how many uh, Pharisees were in the Sanhedrin at this time, do we believe? I've told you a few times. Remember? Three. Yeah, about, about four. There are four by the time that uh, old uh, Paul, Saul, got in. There were four. And so there are four Pharisees in the Sanhedrin. But by invoking the Sanhedrin, what did these Pharisees do? 
the elders of the Sanhedrin. So by saying the Sanhedrin or the elders, they basically did invoke what? They invoked the Sadducees, right? And they invoked the Pharisees. But did the Sadducees believe this? No, Sadducees ignored the Talmud completely. See? So, so what your question is beautiful. Because, yeah, there's, there's political stuff going on here. Now, who controls the knowledge and the education outside of Jerusalem? Pharisees, big time, see? And the Pharisees would love to take over the, the Sanhedrin. They'd love to be a, monop a, you know, minor a majority in, the, in that, but they're not until after the destruction of the temple, right? <clears throat> after the destruction of the temple, that's when the Pharisees basically took over the Sanhedrin, such that it was at the time. Um, and then they got wiped, but that's another thing. So then he replied, Jesus, apokromonoma, he concluded for himself and said, and you know what's really interesting is you notice in the English, uh, in the Greek it says, Jesus concluded for himself and said, epo, in the past tense. The Greek wants to make sure you really understand that Jesus thought about, right? In English we say, he replied. So we cut out a whole sequence in the Greek, which is okay, but in reply, you know, it doesn't tell us, he, he thought for a moment and then he replied. That's the implication in the Greek. So he goes, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. And literally the word is hypocrites. Hypocrites is an actor under an assumed character. Hypocrite. An actor under an assumed character. It is written. Grapho. And by the way, I want to point this out. Calling a person in Greek a hypocrite is not necessarily a total negative. Calling a person a hypocrite in English is a total negative, right? Mm -hmm. But calling a person... An actor under an assumed pseudonym is not necessarily a total negative. Because they could be good at acting? They could be. Well, the Greek, in the Greek worldview, the Greeks believe in diakosune. So in diakosune, if I stand in front of you and I tell you a ball face lie, but I do it really well and get away with it, that's good Greek. That's a very positive Greek thing in the culture. Now, if you catch me, whoa, I, that's bad. The bad thing isn't being a good actor. The bad thing is being a bad actor and getting caught, see? So, <laughs> so guess what Jesus is setting him up for here, <clears throat> right? In the English, a hypocrite's negative. In the Greek, it's not. So he just called him. He said, You're, you are an actor under assumed character. It's not negative. It is written, it's grapho. These people honor Timaeo, prize me with their lips, but their cardia, the center of their emotions, are far from me. Okay? So he, hasn't, he didn't say, you are these people, right, yet. He hasn't accused them yet, but let's see where he goes. And by the way, that's Isaiah 29, 13. Um, I'll, I'll read it for you. It, it, it says in the CJ, what's a CJB? I don't know what CJB is. I got a CJB here. Um, Adonai said, because these people approach me with empty words and honor me, they bestow on me as mere lip service. While in fact they have distanced their hearts from me, and the fear of me is just a mitzvah of human origin. A mitzvah of human origin. Okay? In seven, they worship, they sibona, they revere me. In vain, mutton, folly. They chew without success. Remember that word is beautiful, mutton. Chew without success. Chew without being able to chew the food. Their didasco, their teachings are but in Talmud, in Talmud, an injunction, a set telos, taught didascalo by men. Now I want you to see something very important here. Jesus teaches logos to telos. Socrates teaches Logos to Telos. All really good Greek teachers teach Logos to Telos. What did he say they teach? En Telos. In Toma. In Toma. Predefined conclusion. A predefined conclusion. In other words, you believe what I believe, regard, or believe what I tell you. My way or the highway, kind of. But what's very interesting is this is probably the biggest 
slap in the face you could give to any Greek teacher. In other words, the Greek teacher is teaching the test. He, he, he chews the conclusion and spits it out and gives it to you, right? And the conclusion is pre-concluded. We used to call it the Schofield Ready Mix, Schofield Bible, Schofield Ready Mix. You got all your theology you need from the Schofield Ready Mix conclusions on the bottom of the page, right? You know? I'm just being funny. Some people like the Schofield Bible, but they used to call it Schofield Ready Mix because on the bottom page of your Bible, you would have the predefined conclusions. So you never had to think about it, right? Jesus' whole thing and the Greek whole thing is that you get the logos and you figure out the telos. So this is a big slap. He's starting to slap him, but you notice what he also said. In his quote, his quote, they worship me in vain. Let's see what he does with that. And then he goes in eight. You have let go, you have apthemi, you have sent off of the commands, you have gone off of the intola, the injunctions, the set telos of Theo. Okay, what are the set telos of Theo? The, well, the Torah. The Torah. The, Torah. The, the Big Ten are the, are the body of the Torah, right? But the Torah, because the Torah represents, remember, uh, if you're a good Jewish guy or gal, well, mostly guys, because they didn't train the gals, but guy, then they have the thing where, you know, each one has a chot, a mitzvot, a chot, the stated law, the mitzvot, which is the interpreted law, and the, and whatever the last thing is, which is the punishment for breaking it. So that is the injunctions, right? Because in law, okay, you can't have a law that's a telos, right? You can't have a law that's a telos. You can have an argument that leads to a law, but a law is a law. Don't kill, don't murder, right? That's a law. So that's the point of an entoma from a government kind of thing, right? A governmental kind of thing or a legal type thing. So you have let go, you have gotten off the intola, the set telos of God, and our crato holding with strength, clasping to the paradosis of men. And you notice, Jesus didn't say the paradosis of the elders, right? The paradosis of anthropos, of men. And this is very interesting. He goes on to say, and this is a missing, I believe, out of your, maybe missing out of yours, baptismos of vessels. That is literally the, the immersion of vessels of kai, poterion, drinking vessels, and polos, and much else. Toledos, truly, paramios. This is, this is something you do that is nearly like. In other words, okay, they are only required to, when you eat, when you go to the sacrifice, you do the sacrifice to eat the Thanksgiving sacrifice, you're required to do the mikvah, the whole body, right? And you're required to wash your hands and feet, by the way, whenever you go into the temple. So if you've done the mikvah once within your period, within the period you're required, and you wash your hands and feet in the big vessels there at the temple, now you may eat the teruma. Where does it say that you're required to immerse vessels? It doesn't. Anywhere. In the Torah. In the Talmud, though, and you know, do you see where they got this? Why should you immerse or baptismos vessels? Because the implication is the concept of cleanliness. The concept of cleanliness really only applies to Teruma. But the concept of cleanliness in their minds, by doing a mikvah of their vessels, they are purifying their vessels so that the food and drink that goes in them is now correct. As a matter of fact, if you go to a Jewish bakery to make it kosher, they always take a thumb-sized bit and do a Holocaust offering of that thumb-sized bit of the, of, the, uh, uh, of the dough 
in specifically to to make the make it it's not holy but it's kosher it makes it kosher okay where does that come from uh, it's not in the Torah it's Talmudic so again these are the paradosin of the elders the paradosin well actually paradosin of Antipos of men they've added to it um, one thing I want to mention about this though is a lot of people have this myth idea they, I've heard it said, and you may have heard it said, have you heard it said that there's only, baptism is only used in the New Testament as it applies to baptizing people? Have you heard that? <clears throat> that is an absolute incorrect statement. If you want to lie, it's a myth. Because right here in Mark 7, 8, it specifically talks about the immersion, baptismos of vessels. Why do you have that? I mean, it's not in the NIV. Huh? It's not in the NIV. I know they cut it. And so I, what translation do you have that has it? Um, the real Bible, the, the real Greek. Bible. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. The Jewish Bible has it too. Uh, the Jewish Bible. The, the Jewish Bible, yeah. Oh, yeah. The, I believe that they cut it out because they wanted to be able to retain the myth. There is a myth about the word baptismos. Baptismos means to immerse. Mm -hmm. And it's the word that is reflected as the mikvah. It is the mikvah. We, strong of I say, though, that it is the Christian evolution, right? So how can you give Christian evolution to vessels, <laughs> right? That blows strong of divine's little bitty conclusion out the window. It blows half the theology of a lot of people that like to say that baptismos is something invented for Christianity. It wasn't. It's just a mikvah. It's a mikvah. It's a busy mikvah. Nothing special or new. It was retained symbology by Jesus, by Christianity, to appeal not only to the Jews who were used to mikvah to become clean for uncleanness, right? But also it changed for repentance. And by the way, that repentance idea comes from, you know where? Mysterion. That's a Mysterion idea. To be baptized for repentance. Very interesting things here. Yeah. Okay. Not being familiar with the vessels you're talking about in the temple that they were to wash their hands and feet with. Uh huh. Was did they have running water? I mean, after a, a couple hundred people washed their feet and hands, that certainly could not have been very clean. So I understand it's ritual cleaning, but at the same time. In today's day and age, they probably were dirtier after they put their hands and feet in than they were when they went in. Beautiful question. We're not sure how they did it, but if you remember, go back and look at the tabernacle. There was a thing called the sea. You remember the sea? It's a big brass pot that was stuck in the temple in a tabernacle. We think it was in a similar place to the tabernacle. So here's the Holy of Holies, and the altar is here, and the sea is here. So we, this is the tabernacle and the temple we believe are the same. We don't know exactly where the sea was, but the sea was a big, huge brass pot. And we're not sure how they did it, but they may have um, done absolution. That is, you know, basically taken water either with other pans or pots that were uh, in the temple available, although they probably weren't in the original tabernacle. They may have been available because the temple eventually became wealthy enough to have extra pots. Remember, anything made out of metal is very expensive. You know, it's like, it's like money. So you want people taking the pots. Because they would. I mean, that's big money. So somehow, maybe they were attached to the sea in the temple, so they couldn't be stolen, <laughs> like you attach pins, like it, you know, banks. So, you know, the people may have used those for, the, for their thing to keep the water clean. Now, I want to give you an, an analogy. I've been writing about this in my books, but when you go to a Shinto shrine, Every Shinto shrine has a Corazon, which has running water. All Corazon have running water, either from a well or some other way. And what you do, the first thing you do when you, when you go up to the Torah gate and up to the shadow in the shrine, is the Corazon is on the left-hand side, and you wash your hands, and you rinse your mouth. Mm. So very similar kind of things in all religions to be clean when you approach the deity. So, you know, I, I'm not trying to um, 
show a dilution of Judaism or Christianity. But what I want you to see is, and this is what a lot of writers have written, and Maddox C.S. Lewis wrote about this. Isn't it interesting how you see these purposeful uh, parallels in religious worship? C.S. Lewis said it shows, and by the way, Tertullian wrote and said that this shows how God's influence affects all men. That's what Tertullian wrote. Yes, ma'am. And in front of the, uh, in Jerusalem, at the top of the, where the temple was, where they have the Mosque of Omar, and there's the Golden Omar, there's a big place to sit and wash their feet. Right? I didn't see any water running there, but maybe they turn it off. But they may have. I mean, there was most certainly water running in lots of parts of Rome. Well, there's water running in Jerusalem as soon as Herod stole the money out of the temple or borrowed, borrowed the money from the temple to build the aqueduct, right? Which got in a lot of trouble, but probably made him happy with a lot of the people. The Pharisees, the Sadducees hate him, right? But who knows what happened after that. Let's see. So, nine. And he legoed to them. And he legoed to them. You have a fine way, a kelos, a well, kelos, a well, not agatha, a well, morally, of setting aside, atheo, to set aside, to not put the intola of God in order to observe that literally to watch over your own paradosum. In other words, they put away the commands, the intola, the setelos of God, the laws of God, to protect their own traditions. I mean, do you see how this is getting deeper and deeper, right? I mean, we want to read and just say, okay, well, Jesus is pounding them, right? Jesus is pounding them. First, he says that they're not, they're not acting Greek. They're not being good Greek teachers, which, you know, I suspect that irritated them a lot. And now he's telling them they're not good Jewish teachers. And all that, they're not good Jewish Jews because they're not following God's commands, they're actually putting aside God's commands to follow the traditions. Now, it goes even worse, because he says in 10, for Moses said, and you notice how he's using this, isn't it really cool? Because if Moses says it, it's Torah. For Moses said, epo, honor, tomeo, prize, put value on, and notice he uses the same word, tomeo, put value on, your father and mother, mother, and anyone who curses, literally, kak lego. It's not curses. Anyone who speaks badly of his father or mother must be teleteo. Must be, literally, we like to say finish life. And teleteo means the telos of life. I think this is very interesting that he uses this word. He could have said a lot of words. He could have used the word for destruction. He could have used the word for death, right? But he uses the word, this word. Um, where is it? Where is it? He uses the word, uh, tell, tell the tale. The telos of life. What's the telos of life? Death. Death. Yeah. But he uses it as the telos of life. So he says, anyone who curses, who, who speaks badly of his mother and father, must be given the telos of life. I mean, what a talk about a great euphemism here, because what is he trying to talk to about? Telos. This whole, this whole thing is about telos. Now, why do you think Jesus would be telling us about teloses? Or, why would Mark be focusing on teloses as we're approaching eight? He doesn't want us to miss he doesn't want us to miss the big point. The turning point of Mark is in 8, and it's all about a telos. He doesn't want us to miss this. So guess what? Look how Mark, you know, Mark could have picked a bazillion words to use, or Jesus could have picked a bazillion words to use, right? Mark picks this word, telos. Everything is telos, in telos. He could have used nomos, right? Nomos, the law. There's no nomos anywhere in here. It's all about intoloma. It's all about telos. It's all about paradosin. Um, let's see. Put a finish to death. His father and mother must be finished life to death. 
And it goes on in C, that's that 10, 11. But you logos, you logos, that if a man says, epos, to his father or mother, whatever help you might otherwise have received from me is korban. Korban. That is a dora, a sacrificial gift devoted to God. I already told you that there's a serious problem with korban, because korban does not exist in the Torah or in the Old Testament. Korban is an invention of the Talmud. You say, well, how did they get invention? And then I'll get, let me, let me I'll explain it to you in a second here. Uh, 12, it says, no longer let him do anything for his father. Then you let him no longer do anything for his father and mother. And 13, thus you nullify, you not ratify, a kuro, not ratify the logos of God. I'm going to go back to this. By your paradosis that you've handed down and you do many things like that. All right, this is very important because I'm going to explain to you what this korban thing is. The reason it came up as an issue was because in the Talmud, and you go check the Talmud, this is, um, I don't remember exactly, <coughs> do I have it marked where that is in the Talmud? I expect that Judy has it in her notes if she has her Old te or New Testament uh, thing in there. But she may know exactly where the Talmud, this is in the Talmud. But in the Talmud, there is an account. Remember, the Talmud is an explanation of how they got to the law or to the, to the paradosin the laws that exist. And one of the questions that came out of the Babylonian catastrophe for them was there, the, a man's rabbi was captured and held for ransom. And his parents were captured and held for ransom. And the man was a rabbi. And he went, he went to the Sanhedrin. He went to the Jewish rabbi rabbinical experts, and his question was this. Whom should I ransom first? Should I ransom my parents or my rabbi? And the reason was because when you have a rabbi, your rabbi is considered your spiritual father. The rabbinical court spends not a whole lot of time on this. Obviously, they're all rabbis. Because their conclusion was that you should ransom your rabbi. And that is what is called korban. The korban is the ransom. They say a ransom of a rabbi. And so therefore, this little thing that starts in Malachi as the priests taking or stealing the tithe and holding it in the coffers of the temple became then this idea of korban, which is a sacrificial gift. So instead of supporting their parents, what they did is they brought the money, they brought the support for their parents, the doron, in Greek, to the temple, and they put it in the temple coffers, which provided a pension for the rabbis. And by the way, they do the exact same thing today in Jerusalem. An Orthodox rabbi can get a full stipend to do Orthodox studies, and they could do it for years under the Yiddish rules and under Jerusalem rules, if you're an Orthodox rabbi, it is possible for you to be supported by Korban. So were, is, was it to the detriment then of the parents? Were you taking money away from what you would were supposed to use to support your family? Well, guess what? These are Pharisees and rabbis. And so they're paying into their own pension. Mm -hmm. Instead of paying to their parents to take care of their parents, the pension money, it's, it's like a pension deal, right? I pay the pension in my generation, and then I live off of it, right? So Corban is basically one of the first pension plans, like Social Security, except it doesn't go to your parents. 
it goes only to the rabbis. So yeah, it, it was directly to the detriment of both their families. And Jesus could have mentioned it goes to the detriment of their wives, too. But guess what? If they declared Korban, they, they couldn't legally declare Korban of the wives' goods, right? But they could prevent the wife from getting any money from them. So is he equating then that they should be put to death like the law said because they didn't honor their father and mother? Bingo. Mm -hmm. That, okay. You know, Jesus didn't like death penalty, right? He just told them to put a millstone around somebody's neck throw them in the ocean. <laughs> Jesus didn't like death penalty, but he just told them to put them to death for, he basically told them to tell it to him, right? Mm -hmm. For not following the law of God. Yes, ma'am. Well, is it fair to say that we're simplifying that the Talmud was basically uh, a bunch of loopholes to get out of doing what God said you should do, uh, to get out of obeying the, the Torah? There, there is a lot of evidence that a lot of it is. So, for example, the law, you know, the rule. There is a rule that you can only go a day's walk on a Sabbath, on Shabbat, mm -hmm. right? But by putting a rope, literally, there is a rope around Jerusalem so that all of Jerusalem now becomes a um, corizo, a... a uh, uh, it's the allowed amount that you put that a day's journey over. Well, well, no, I, I'm sorry, I was skipping back and forth. It, it says there's a day's journey thing, but there's also a thing that you can go within a courtyard, right? And a courtyard is defined in the Talmud as an area that can be enclosed with a rope. So there's a rope going around, was a rope going around all of Jerusalem, because that way you could walk through all of Jerusalem because it was a courtyard. The day's journey thing is you would send a Gentile servant, a servant that was not a, not a Jew, out to put food at at a specific spot so you could go that journey because it was considered that refreshment was like you know going on a picnic not a journey so therefore you could legally go a long ways on a Shabbat because your servant would be placing food or even you have your servant sitting there with the food you know and, and you take a bite and then you continue on your journey and he would follow along right so yes you're precisely right that's why Jesus says you you've set aside the internal of the commands of God for the traditions. The traditions, what the Talmud represents. But I don't want to cast the Talmud in a totally negative light. That's, that would be improper, imprecise, incorrect. Because the Talmud is not a... I think the Talmud has a lot to tell us. It proves Jesus. Because one of the Talmuds says how Mary was raped by a Roman soldier and gives her name and gives the name of the Roman soldier, and that's how Jesus was born. That was 200 years later, right? So what does that prove? Number one, that the idea that virgin, she was a virgin was a big deal that had been gone back to that period. Number two, that her name exists, and number three, that Jesus was born, right? So the Talmud proves a whole bunch of the proof texts and stuff. It's a great document. So I don't want to throw it out with the bathwater. There are issues with it, okay? Just remember, uh, Martin Luther didn't like five of the New Testament documents either. Uh, let's see, Hebrews, James, Hebrews, James, uh, Second Peter, Revelation, and Jude. Yeah, he didn't like. He threw them out. He put them in. He put them in special sections. We we added them back in. He didn't like the Apocrypha either. He threw them out, and they stayed thrown out for some reason. We didn't read them. But you know, you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So don't throw out these documents. Don't throw out Jude and, and Hebrews and whatever just because Martin Luther didn't like them. And likewise, don't throw out the Talmud because there are some issues in the Talmud. Okay? So, anyway, let's go back really quickly, or not go back so much as, as we're here. Um, the big question of the big end part here. Okay? Because this sent away, obviously, the, they, they didn't have anything to say. But it says this. 13. Thus you nullify, you don't ratify the logos of God by your paradosis that you've handed down. And you do many things like that. What I want to focus on is what he says. <laughs> Thus you nullify the logos. Do you see this whole state, this, this whole part about the Pharisees, although it is part of the logo, larger logos <laughs> to tell us, it is a short logos to tell us where Jesus is trying to tell you that the logos, their logos, isn't has only... Entalma, set telos. 
that their logos is a tetulateo, an end of life telos, a conclusion of life telos, that their telos is only paradosin, near gift. And then the last statement he makes is, thus you nullify the logos of God. I'm really sorry that we have to translate this as word, because it's the logos, it's the argument of God. And if you look at it within that context, isn't that beautiful? That what Jesus is saying is that, you know, I, matter of fact, in John it says that Jesus is the logos, the amar, the power word, the command word of God. And then here in Mark, we have him say, thus you nullify the argument of God. What's the argument of God? Jesus, Jesus Christ. Just, you know, the connections are beautiful. We, you know, we shouldn't miss it even in the English. Except that we're kind of predisposed, right? We've got this predisposition to miss it because, you know, We've heard, okay, the word is Jesus, right? The word is the gospel. Uh, what's gospel? Well, I don't know what the gospel is exactly. Jesus died, Jesus rose, right? You know, that's the mystery of faith. What's the gospel? Well, talk to a Baptist pastor, and he might tell you a little bit different than a Lutheran pastor. I, I'm not saying they'll be different enough to not, not lead to salvation, but their idea of what is the gospel. What would Jesus' idea of the gospel be? His idea of the gospel is this legos, this argument, that's conclusion is God. And, and we'll find more about that specific conclusion. Isn't it the reconciliation <coughs> with God? Because we were separated. I mean, the Doron. Yeah. That Jesus himself, basically, the, the, only, okay, the only way that you can conclude this logos is that Jesus is God. That's the telos of Mark. Specifically, the Telos of Mark is Jesus is God. And that, yes, he is the Christos, the Doron. And we'll see that. That's, you know, but, but this is of setup. This is Mark's setup. He's setting us up for this climactical conclusion that then leads for the rest of Mark. Because there's more things that Mark needs to tell us, which is the specifics of the gospel. Thank you, Father, for your word. We pray that you look out because this week brings up the back safety in your name. We pray amen. Did it work? Still going.